Tonight, our uh, presentation is going to be live. It's going to be three members of the club talking about telescopes and basically how to start off uh, with uh, a telescope and, and uh, the things that beginners will encounter. So I'm going to be demonstrating the, the Dobson, the Dobsonian telescope. That's the simplest because I'm the simplest person. <laughs> and then uh, we're going to have Richard is going to uh, show you how to get started with astrophotography. And so it's really designed to kind of get you off the ground. And then uh, uh, we're going to have uh, Danny Skisleski, and he's going to show you how to set up his polar aligned uh, telescope and some of the interesting uh, features of that kind of setup. Before we go any further, I just want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Seashell Band, and we appreciate that. Okay, so uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I'm going to start my portion of this presentation, and I want to talk to you about the Dobsonian telescope. So I'm just going to re retreat from behind the, the lectern and out front. So the, the Dobsonian telescope used to be the telescope of choice for amateur astronomers. And it combined a number of uh, virtues. First of all, it, it combined a large aperture, which means a bright image. It was a very uh, simple mount, which meant that it was easy to set up. It was a low mount, low to the ground, which meant it was very stable. It didn't uh, jiggle when you were uh, looking through it and uh, fiddling with the controls. And it was low cost. Now, the one uh, sort of defect, well, there's two actually, was it does not track the stars. You just move it along by bumping it along, um, which actually, if you're doing visual observing, is not a problem. And the other thing is that in order to use it, you actually have to know your way around the stars. Well, I'd like to promote the virtues of the Dobsonian telescope tonight for a variety of reasons, but one of which is that our club has three of these. Uh, two of them are in good shape. One of them needs a little bit of cleanup and they are available on loan to any member of the club. So you can borrow these and in a sense, use it and keep it until somebody else wants to turn, uh, which is a pretty good deal. Uh, so I looked them up and these are $1,500 now. They used to be around the $400, $500 mark. So things have inflated over the, the my uh, short career in as amateur astronomy. But uh, it's a good deal. And um, some of the, well, the downside that you actually have to know your way around the sky is actually one of the joys of amateur uh, astronomy. We've had a few uh, astrophysicists shamefacedly say that the object that they're studying and have poured their life, life into for the last few years. They have no idea where it is in the sky, okay? <laughs> and, and I'd like to know where, where, where is the pillars of creation? Can I point to it? Where, where is the Horsehead Nebula? Well, you know, I, I'd like to know that just to get a little bit of a perspective. So this will help you do that, forces you to do that. So let's just uh, show uh, you how this thing is set up and the kind of problems you'll run into as a beginner. That's the only thing I can tell you about because I'm a beginner myself. So first of all, uh, this is the base. It's not light, but it's not unbearably heavy. And you just need to set it up on a level spot. Uh, it could be your driveway or a sidewalk outside your house or, or part of the lawn. You might want you to just take one of those little levels and put it on, just to make sure it's roughly level. It's not absolutely critical. It's just something that improves uh, with it being level. And then there is the, the uh, optical tube, and it's uh, a big baby. Again, it's not unbearably heavy. And you just simply sit it down like this. Okay. Like that. And then, you, of course, you need a, a little bag for your accessories. And amongst them are two, two little handles. And so the handles. Uh, just like so. 
And uh, I think that one of the virtues of these handles is they tighten up and just provide a little bit of friction um, so that when you're tilting this in the vertical plane, then it will stay put. You want that, you don't want it to sort of go sagging way down or sort of lifting way up, depending on whether you're using a, a big eyepiece or not. So you just want it to have a little bit of friction. So that's it. Now, if you've ever set up a tripod, that was amazingly quick. And that's one of the virtues of this, this instrument. It, you can set it up and within five minutes, you're observing. Okay. Now it has a dust cover uh, on the main aperture and also a dust cover on the eyepiece. And both are important. I don't know for sure, uh, what happened out of the uh, out of the observatory shed? But this one, this uh, telescope has been there for several years, sitting there doing nothing, while mice and rats and spiders and all kinds of things were crawling around the shed. And uh, it had both its covers on. And when I popped everything off, got a beautiful clean mirror down there at the bottom. Amazing. There was another one, and it was missing the eye cover. When I looked at the bottom of that, I went, oh boy, this needs some work, okay? So it's really important just to have that, uh, those, uh, those covers. Okay, so now uh, what I would recommend is uh, if you borrow this, that you set it up in the daytime. Matter of fact, I set it up in my living room and I aimed it out the window at a tree in the distance. It's got to be pretty far away. <clears throat> Trees that are too close, I can't focus in on them. But it's got to be a distant tree. And then uh, I use what this gadget here, which is known as a red dot finder. And all you do is you just turn it on. There's a little battery inside. Don't, don't wear it out. Turn it off when you're not using it. And you crank it up. And then when you look through, you don't see anything out here. But when you look through it, you see that there's a red dot. Okay. Now, in fact, if it's... Uh, light out as, as it was, yeah, I, if they had put my hand in front of it, oh, okay, right, I see the red dot. Now, the virtue of this red dot is as you move your head around, you see this red dot moving back and forth inside the, the scope, but it's not moving with respect to the distant sky. It's at one spot in the sky, and that's the beauty of it. Okay, so what I did was I just looked through, and there's the red spot, and then I just rotated this around, and then I plunked it right on the top of that cedar tree about a quarter of a mile away. Okay. So then the next thing I needed was an eyepiece. So there are three eyepieces that come with these sets, brand new. And you use the one with the longest uh, focal length. This says 40 millimeters. So we have 40, 25, and nine millimeters. So you use the one with the longest focal length. And that why, why, you, is that, why do you start with oh, the longest? Okay, and that's because you get the, the lowest magnification and therefore the widest field of view. You will see the most sky through this, the 40 millimeter eyepiece. So you put that in. Oh, now one little glitch here is that you can't put it all the way in and seat it because uh, we need to make some adjustments on the focuser. So I, I just put it in and leave it out be sort of sticking out a good half inch or so. And then it turned out that I then looked through and lo and behold, after I focused it, I was looking straight at the top of that cedar tree. So amazingly, this thing had been sitting around, kicked around in our shed for the last few years, bumped home in my car. Mm -hmm. Everything was still aligned in alignment. However, that's not, that I was lucky. Typically, what you need to do is they're not in alignment. If they're not in alignment, then what you have to do is first find the object in the eyepiece, which is a little tricky. Uh, and when you're out under the stars, you pick a bright star. Kind of you aim this thing roughly in the direction of the bright star. You've got to get it into the eyepiece. Once you get it into the eyepiece, you say, oh, yeah, there it is. Get it right in the middle, center it. And then there's two little screws here, uh, right, left, here, up, down, very intuitive. And you just line up that red dot on the star. And now your telescope 
and your red dot finder are aligned. Okay, so you've now got the scope ready to go. Now, if you actually take it outside at night, one thing that you need to add, and this is fairly critical, is a dew shield. Now, this dew shields are something like this. There, and if you hold around like this, whoops, make a cylinder. You plop them over the end. Unfortunately, this isn't quite big enough to go over, but it goes over the end. And it has actually this way, this way. It goes over the end and it has two, um, it does two things for you. Number one is it prevents dew or slows down dew uh, settling on the secondary mirror. You don't have this on within 20 minutes, everything goes foggy. So you have to have a dew shield. And the other thing is that there's spray, there may be stray light coming in, you know, from that telephone pole over there, or maybe even the moon, and it kind of comes in and it kind of bounces down the scope and kind of washes out the image. Well, this gives you some extra protection from stray light. Okay, so that's a really necessary feature. Okay, so now, now comes the 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 uh, uh, point where we're actually going to look at the stars. So we've got it set up. We've got our finder scope, our finder, our dot red dot finder aligned, and so then we need to actually get to know the stars. So here, this is the March's uh, March edition of Sky and Telescope, and this is the this uh, sky map that they have published in each each month. But you can, you know, there's other options besides this. So there's there's one. So you look at this, and then also here we have uh, the the Explore the Universe program, and it lists from this the RASC lists off some of the things that you can look at. Uh, and these are probably the easier targets for you to find. So you take a look, and uh, here we are in winter. And winter, it says, oh, my goodness, the Orion Nebula. I mean, how many have heard of the Orion Nebula? Okay, well, the Orion Nebula is something that even I can find. Okay, uh, you have to know where the Orion constellation is. Okay, so you get that picture. You have the three, uh, the three bright stars for the belt and the, the shoulders and the feet. Okay, there it is. There's Orion Nebula. And then there's a sword that's hanging down from the belt. And that sword is where the Orion Nebula is. Okay, so now I'm going to look at it. So what I do is look down here and I say, oh my goodness, my red dot finder is way too bright now because it's so dark out. So I turn it down as dimly as it can go so I don't wash out all the other stars. And I wing it around here. And there it is. Okay. Right down there in the sword of Orion. And then I look through here. And there it is, everything's focused. Beautiful. And I see the cloud and the trapezium. Then uh, I say, okay, I want to see it under higher power. So take out the 40 millimeter and I put in the 20, 25, actually. The 25. So that's going to almost double the size of everything I. C. And of course, it's also going to restrict the view. Okay. So I'm going to be zeroing in on the center. So again, I put it in, don't put it in all the way. You're going to have to just figure out how much. And then you're going to have to put refocus. That's a, a downside to a lot of telescopes. And you'll discover something, and that is the higher the magnification, the harder it is to focus. It's just like a microscope, same thing. You know, you use a fine focus for the high power. Same thing here. So um, then if you want, you can go to the nine, which will more than double the, the size again. Again, you'll zero in. The, um, uh, again, you'll find it's uh, even harder to focus. And you also, of course, realize that, that it becomes more washed out. So on a given night, in a given target, you might find that there's an optimum size where you get the best combination of the size of what you're looking at and the brightness. So that's, that's how a Dobson, Dobsonian telescope works. So the virtues, I think, are considerable. Uh, notice I didn't have to worry about where Polaris was. 
Uh, I don't have to work. One of the things that frustrated me when I had a go-to tell someone, oh, this is going to be so easy, right? You just push the button, right? But inevitably, inevitably the alignment stars, which you have to start out with, they, oh, it was behind that tree over there or behind the house over here. And I could never get the thing lined up. Here, you don't even have to worry about that. You just take it out, set it up, and go. Yeah. I would mention with a Dobsonian, yeah. uh, typically because they start with a nice wide field of view, things move. Yeah. And okay. yeah, that's the cool thing about having the motor drive. Right. Yeah. It doesn't disappear in 30 seconds. Whereas if you go with a nine millimeter on that, I'll go wave bye bye. What's that? I'll be going into that. Yes. Yeah. 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 That, that, that is. The, another feature, of course, this is not tracking the star. The star appears to be moving across the sky. And, um, and so the higher the magnification, the faster it appears to move across your field of view. And therefore, the more you have to nudge. And of course, it's a bit of a trick because not only is the uh, image upside down, but it's actually off at an angle. And that's because the, uh, the focuser isn't like horizontal, it's right. coming off at an angle. So trees are kind of at a funny angle and upside down. Okay, so you get it, but it's it's not that difficult. Yeah, you know, if you ever used a microscope in you know, school or whatever, you pretty quickly got to learn how you move the slide in order to see you know what you were looking for. So uh yeah, you have to keep nudging it. Okay, that's uh so that's it for the dog. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question from chat, and the question is, uh, no dew heater. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I let it in. Yeah, yeah. There, there. You, you. Uh, uh, the the dew heater. Um, this is um, probably for the whole. Yes, so the whole aperture. But what you might want is a dew heater for the um, eyepiece. But I've also seen some people just kind of tuck it in their shirt pocket and keep it warm, and then oh, take yeah. it out. Okay. So um, yeah, that's a bit fancy, but yeah, a dew heater will uh, keep it warm, a little bit warm, and that will again keep the dew from settling on your eyepiece. And that is a factor, you know, that you you'll start to get frustrated. You know, you'll breathe on the on the eyepiece. And, oh crap! <laughs> okay, so yeah, a dew heater or some some way of keeping them warm. Okay, any other uh, questions? So that's a um, that. The equipment that you showed us tonight is a club telescope that is loanable at no charge to any member of the club. That is correct. That is correct. Okay, good. Now I would like to turn uh, the next phase of the meeting over to Richard Mitchell, who's going to talk about getting involved in astrophotography. Um, <clears throat> well, this is very basic for people who have never tried astrophotography is how you might get started. And the simplest way is just to use a regular camera. If you have a DSLR or there is one, the club has one that's actually very similar to my uh, Nikon. Um, and you can just <clears throat> buy a nose feed. This is one and a quarter inch, actually, you can get two inches as well. What do you call that, a nose piece? Nose piece, they call oh, yeah. it. This this thing that goes into the one and a quarter aperture, um, and so then um, it um, and it just goes straight into the <coughs> eyepiece. Is that, is that those piece of magnifier as well? No, so no lens in it at all. So, so you, you, you just took a lens out, are you going to get like zero magnification there? Well, yeah, if you don't want that, you, you basically want the focal plane to be in the plane of the center. So you can, but the problem, of course, is movement, which I'll come to. I've got some slides, but I'm not going to be so ambitious to try and run the slides at the same time as... The, the visual, I think that could be a bit risky. <clears throat> um, but so you can, but as uh, Richard pointed out, you've obviously got to worry about motion. And there is a 
formula, which I'll come to when I get to the slide, which determines uh, the maximum exposure you can have without um, creating star trails. And it's very short. It depends on the focal length of the lens, but I mean, it's technical. Um, but you can, if you have a camera like this, you can set it to high ISO, relatively short exposure of a few seconds. And you can get some fairly uh, decent photographs of some bright objects. Uh, and the procedure basically is to use the um, <laughs> set the ISO for high value, put it into uh, manual mode, set the maximum aperture, um, put it into uh, manual focus, um, and <laughs> point this at a bright star, um, put it into live view, Max, <clears throat> zoom right in as far as you can go, and then play with the focus until you've got the bright star roughly at the point. Um, and then you, so, and so then basically, I've never done it as a Dobsonian, but I, basically what you would want to do is to probably, well, you could look through the, the viewfinder, and look, but also possibly roughly align it with the eyepiece and then just swap it over and um maybe the same photograph and it's um so um yeah uh, <clears throat> and let's say you should, and then probably take several shots and then we can stack them so i'll come to that when i'm getting to the slide um but that that's my sort of one of the most basic things you can do. Um, but an equally uh, basic thing you can do actually um, is just to take photographs actually with the camera and um, you can actually mount it on a tripod. And again, if you keep the exposure short, matter of seconds, keep the ISO up. You can take some quite decent shots of oh sorry. Um, um sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. sorry. actually my daughter just arrived in Mexico. This is <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm. Can you just excuse me? I'm just in the middle of giving a, a lecture. Can I just get that? <laughs> okay. Sorry, they just don't have that. It's just arriving today in Mexico. <laughs> None of us can talk. Grandchildren <laughs> calling to tell me. And anyway, I'll get back to them in a second. So, yeah, so you can do that. But, um, and then. Um, I'll do this at the slideshow, but I don't want to do them both at the same time because we have all kinds of problems with Zoom trying to get slideshows and screen share to work at the same time. Uh, this is an astro camera, which is more sophisticated, <laughs> um, which is basically just a, um, a sensor. It's cool. You can cool it down to minus 30 degrees, which uh, reduces the noise. And you put this on something like a uh, scope and you can get some you can control it with a laptop and take a series of, of shots and get some fairly decent um, images. And then the other, um, <clears throat> on what I wanted, so I'm going out to Australia in a couple of weeks, and I want to get some shots of the um, Magellanic clouds. And there are, so, there are a lot of objects down there that we can't see up here. And I thought, what do I do? I can't take that on the airplane or even my, um, telescope on the airplane. Uh, what I can do um, is take this, uh, which is basically just a tracker that rotates the same speed as the Earth, and it'll keep the uh, camera in a fixed position relative to the stars. So you can take uh, longer exposures. And then again, when we get to my slides, you'll see um, the different <coughs> fields of view, uh, you can actually get some very good uh, shots with, with a lens of sort of 50 to 80 millimeters. And if you, I don't know if you saw 
uh, Michael Watson's presentation, um, but a lot of his photos uh, were just taken with a, an ordinary camera. They weren't taken with a telescope. So, <clears throat> so that's it. And then um, another kind of photography uh, is planets. Uh, that's Saturn taken with the club telescope. And the difficulty with planets is they're small and bright. They're very small. They're a few relative 30 arc seconds or something across. And it's very hard to get the resolution, especially from here uh, with the seeing conditions that they kind of sort of flicker in and out <clears throat> in a very small image uh, on the sensor. Um, so the way we do that uh, is with a planetary camera like this, which has a small uh, sensor in it with a fine pitch. Um, and <clears throat> we take, take a video at, um, <laughs> typically 60 frames a second, so I get about 3,000 frames, uh, typically, um, of, a, of a planet as a video. And then when you stack, well, when you stack them, it, it's, you, you choose one that looks the best, and then it will take the best 20% or whatever you set. Stack them all together, which improves the signal to noise ratio because it kind of averages out noise. Um, and you can, get some fairly decent images. I'd say this was taken with the club scope uh, using this planetary camera and it's stacked from about uh, 3,000 images. I'm sure you oh, the camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is another one uh, of Jupiter. Uh, I don't know, but... Uh, that's... Can you show at this point? <laughs> That's right, you, you present. That was taken actually with my Celestron from home. But again, there's a street light in front of my house, which doesn't make, yeah, it doesn't help. But um, anyway, so these. Um, how does that, excuse me, how does that lens cool down to so low the temperature? It's a fine so electric cooler. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's, it's supposed to, I haven't cooled it down that much, but it, it's supposed to be about minus 30. So it's quite it's pretty low noise. So this is a fairly uh, upscale astro camera. It's color. I mean, the professionals use monochrome and then have different filters, but then that introduces another whole range of complications. This is sort of a good space. Oh, and actually, I did mention four. Um, for taking deep sky objects with this camera on this, I probably want to reduce the ISO down to about 800 or 1600. Um, take um, a series of shots, but not 3,000, sort of 15 or 20 or something. Um, let's say a minute exposure. And I can, well, I can do that in two ways. I can either I can either connect that to my laptop and use. Um, software program like SharpCap or something. Um, or also, I've got, I've got a little in interval timer, uh, which will just take a sequence of shots on this camera at set, it, uh, set interval for a set period of time. So um, we'll just go if I, <clears throat> to my, um, hang on a second. Um, so, yeah, so why astrophotography? Well, it's not just a case of uh, making a record, although it's quite fun to be able to show people what you were looking at. Um, one of the main reasons is that you can see colors and you can see objects that you simply cannot see in a telescope because of the um, sensitive to the eye. The eye is not sensitive to color at very low uh, light levels. Um, so that's um, just an example. That's the, um, well, that's my the Saturn. That was taken with the club scope using this planetary camera. And that's the Bale Nebula taken at the observatory, but uh, with my 400 millimeter refractor. 
Um, now, <laughs> to give you an idea of the different uh, fields of view, um, uh, can I do that? How do I do that? Yeah, that's right. Um, collapse the film. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over seated on the left. Yeah, yeah. Which one? Yeah, so the back. The upper one. The upper that was slack. High. That one. Yeah. 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 Um. So, um. And then that's, that's what I was saying earlier was the way you can use an ordinary camera. If you just take a 200 millimeter lens, which is just a sort of typical color photo for a standard camera, you don't need a telescope. Um, you, can, you can get the, the whole of the veil nebula in, in a single view, field of view. And then what I did was you take the club scope at the observatory with an icon, which is Mine is a 7200, but it's essentially the same as the one that the club has available to borrow. Uh, it just actually nicely frames the fourth head nebula. So we were talking about maybe following up the session with an actual practical at the observatory. And it seemed to me that that would make quite a good uh, object to photograph. Uh, as a, as it's fairly bright, or at least the background is bright, and it's relatively easy uh, to to take. So, so that photograph there, how many how many would be stacked on that? That's not mine, actually. I have to say, I've got. I don't think it's that much different from mine, but, it, it's, but even, even, that one is from Stellarium. But I would stack about. Uh, oh, um, well, actually, in mine, I stacked about forty. Forty. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, did you explain the, the far one? Uh, uh, the, the far one is just to show the, the, the very small field of view that you would get if you use the club scope, which is uh, four meters focal length. Versus a camera. Versus a camera. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily, you know, a telescope that is the answer. You, a telescope is good for taking small things, but if, you, if you're interested in taking the Milky Way or big nebula or something, you can do it perfectly well with a, an ordinary camera. And if, and then if you put a tracker on uh, like this, which is portable, that's why I got it, so I can take it with me to Australia, I can essentially, for, for larger objects, I can do as well as, as with a telescope. And they say, if you, I don't, if you saw Michael Watson's presentation, I, it was notable that <clears throat> most of his amazing photographs were, um, taken with a, a, an ordinary camera. Um, yeah, so, well, I think I mentioned that earlier. That's just sort of basically the steps that you would go through uh, to take that with a Nikon camera. Um, you could use something like this and if the club has a camera called a Malin cam, which is similar to this one, but that is not basic astrophotography. That's kind of intermediate. <laughs> the next stage. So, um, um, but this this would be cooled and controlled with uh, the computer, and actually, um, so. Um, yeah, and again, well, I was just again looking at the, the, the difference between planetary cameras. You got on the one hand, you got small bright objects, and on the other hand, you've got large faint objects, and the techniques you use for the two types of object are different. With a with the small bright objects, <clears throat> they're very small, as 30 arc seconds or something, you take that, you know, 3,000 frames in the hopes that you get some good ones and then you stack the good ones and hopefully get uh, a decent image. Um, yeah, and I just, um, 
Richard was talking about the uh, star trails and the way typically that you can work out the maximum exposure is you divide, essentially you divide 500 by the focal length, uh, gives you a sort of, and then you have to add in this crop factor and that's simply the ratio of the sensor size to a 35 millimeter to a full frame camera. So if it's a full frame camera, it's one. And if it's an APS sensor like this one, unlike most of the sort of so-called semi-professional cameras in 1.5, and if it was, um, uh, well, mostly I think generally we're using a DSLR, so we generally 1.5, but it sort of just gives you, it's an order of seconds, depending the wider the angle of the, the, <coughs> the um, the longer the exposure can be. So, so, so then if you had a telescope, you'd have to put in the focal long lens with the focal length of the telescope, which would make it very short. Very short, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and then this is just one other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit. And this is a gross exaggeration, but a camera like that has about 4,000 or 4,096 12-bit intensity levels, <clears throat> um, which it actually records if you take raw uh, image file. But your screen only has 256 levels, intensity level for each color, eight bits, the 24-bit color, 24-bit pixels or arrangement of pixels anyway. Each pixel is eight bits. 256 intensity level. And what happens, and as this is grossly exaggerated, but it was just for effect, is that when you take astro images, <clears throat> there is a often a narrow range um, of intensity levels that just don't show up when you first look at the image on an ordinary screen. And what you can do, and it's called stretching, is basically take that narrow range of data and spread it out over the 256 intensity levels uh, that's displayed on the screen. And suddenly, like magic, um, what appeared to be gnomish just sort of turns into a um, something like that, the, uh, this, or that's the California nebula. Um, Oh, I haven't got the screen. Um, and that's just mm -hmm. something else that you can do in post-processing. The stacking, which is basically signal-to-noise ratio, and also in the case of planetary photography, it's selecting the best frame. So you allow for fluctuations in the scene conditions, which just vary. If you look through, look at a planet, it's sort of coming in and out of focus the whole time. So if you just take a rapid sequence of frames, you're going to get some good, it's called, sort of called lucky imaging, you get some good ones and stack those. Um, and then this it gives you um, a way to get detailed images out of something that literally you can have a an image when you look at it in when you in the camera, you look at it on the screen, there doesn't seem to be anything there. And then you stretch it like this and suddenly you've got a whole a whole nebula in front of you. It's, it's actually almost sort of like magic. Um, okay. um, any questions? Oh, well, yes. So yeah, you're going to put holidays down south. You're going to take that tracker. Yes. Is that battery operated or do you have to plug it into something? No, it, yeah, it's battery. It's got a lithium okay. battery. In it. And, and that will track the same speed as the Earth? Yes. Very cool. And it's, and it's, I don't, I, <clears throat> I can line it up with more or less accuracy. The more accurate it is, but obviously the longer exposure I can take. Yeah. But if it's not completely accurate, it just means I can't take such long exposures. So, so when you come back from your holiday, will you uh, be able to show us something? Well, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Southern Cross is easy. I've already done that, but, um, I was hoping something like the Magellanic Palace or something like that could do. Because there's quite a lot of things there. Yeah. But I couldn't, you know, I can take this, but I couldn't take that.
Oh, well, not not without shipping. It. So it beats the hell out of sitting on a mountain top for an hour for one exposure. Yes. In the in the cold. Yeah. With film. Yeah, yeah. Well, the census now, so yeah, the old days. Yeah, so much more efficient. First thing I do, and the most important thing you do when you go out, because we're using what they call a German equatorial mount, dual axis motors on it. It's really important to make sure your telescope's level and you got to get your mount steady and pointed north. Now, I had a compass, or you can use your phone, most of them have a compass and get due north. It, it's very important because this type of mount tracks the sun, the moon, the stars. So you, you have to make sure that everything is aligned. So is that a magnetic north or a... Uh... No, polarity is I go for I go for polarity. So now what I do is I hold this bed and screw this knot on. Need something on there. You just need to use your curved hand. Yeah. No, you don't want this to fall. You fix the motors on it. So now it's snug. Now here's the little thing. If you're going out at night at the airport, right? This is metal. So when you put this here on. Don't tighten it too much because metal expands and you don't have the help time taking it off at the end of the night. Sometimes it gets tight. So just get it snug. Now, this is important. This is your IP dish and it also stabilizes your, the leg on your telescope. And you want this real stable because you may want to use this photography but you're tracking, and so steady is important. Now, I'm going to forget about do north of this for TV purposes here. Put it sideways so you can see. Now, this here is a what they call a, a motor drive. It's a dual axle Go motor. The other side now. Okay, and. Please. This is what will track. So we got this set here. I'm going to take this cap off here and this cap off here and show you something. This here is how you know if you're polar aligned. Another important thing is if you're out in grass, take a little knee pad. Then you can kneel on this, look through that, you can see Polaris. You know you're tracking because if you don't track perfectly, it's almost a waste of time. So let's we'll put this back on. Sorry, sorry, I'm not quite sure. When you put the light through, what were you trying to Just do? Just to show that you can see oh, clearly through. You can okay. visualize. Oh. You can visualize. It's okay. all in the center there. To align it, to polar yeah. align it. So now we've done that. So do you typically visually align to uh, North Star? Yeah, to typically Polaris. Through the hole? Through the hole. Okay. Now, I've re now th this is the next thing that's important. I've done this ahead of time, but you have your latitude that the North Star is on. So once you've set it, and these are, are your, uh, these are little things you can loosen off and tighten to get this set to the latitude. And we're at, uh, here it's about 48 degrees. Once you've set it for here, you never have to do it again. Okay. So now it's set. So this is uh, all set up. The next step is counterweight. So you screw this weight bar on. And it's another thing that you, don't snug it up too much because it'll it'll expand too. Just enough. Perfect. And I have pre-marked 
using the lightweight. I usually use a lot heavier scope than I'm using tonight on, on this uh, scope, but I brought this for demonstration purposes. We put the safety screw on here in the end so that the weight doesn't slide off. Now, we have gears here, locking gears that allow you to slew right, left, right section, declination. So we put this here, we'll lock this down and I'll put a telescope on it. Now this is a beautiful little Williams optical telescope. I really don't use this a lot for astronomy. It's more, I, it's, it's a real good uh, spotting scope for daytime things. And, or if you're, you know, I've got so many big telescopes, that, but I brought this for purposes. But this is a beautiful spotting scope if you're doing uh, stuff on land. So you see how I put it in? I've got a dovetail here and you just snug it up and now, this is important. Unlock it, see if it's balanced. That's not bad, it's going to the front, but I haven't got an eyepiece in it. So I'd say it's balanced that way. So I'll just lock that down and see how the balance is this way. Now this is important because you've got motors in here and you don't want them to work too hard. So now it seems to be reasonably balanced. So I'm going to lock it down and I'm going to attach my uh, my controller. Now this is 12 volt. Myself, I just click this on here. I've got two cables here and they're like a telephone. And one side is right ascension and one side is declination. So I mark these. This is declination on this side. So I plug this in. What is, what is declination? Okay. Oh, the north and south from your solar field. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like I said, I know how it works. I don't know why it works. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Yeah. So now I've got the motors in. And on this motor, it's, I've got a dual dual axle. So this will move it right, left, and track. Now, when you're using the motors, there's a locking key here. You have to turn it and snug it up, and that engages the motor. If you're going to move it around, you disengage that. This side doesn't matter. It's just going one way all the time. This side. So now I've got the the motor, I on this paddle, you can set it for southern hemisphere or northern hemisphere. So I'm putting it on northern hemisphere. Now, if I'm tracking the sun, I've got it on eight time. If I'm doing a star, I just turn it down. So there's different speeds here. So I'm going to shut it off because we don't need that. Excuse me. Like it, it, should, it, it has like a little mark that says sun no i just know that's because the sun's moving a lot faster pretty yeah, fast the, yeah, the lot earth this is slightly faster yeah so you set it for that okay why it works i don't know it's just okay. okay so i've got that set up now say you want to take a picture or actually there's there's two things you can do Maybe I'll show you this little neat feature first. If you're if you're uh, using it as a spotting scope on land, you know everything is upside down when you're looking into space. On land, it's not upside down. So you can buy this. And this is like two mirrors. So you're looking down the tube. It's there. There's another mirror with slide like this. The light goes down. And this writes everything up. So if I want to use this on land, I put this in and I can use it for birding, spotting, scope, or whatever. 
do you lose a lot of uh, the uh, image brightness with that? I don't notice any difference. Okay. No, it's pretty, you know, it's a daytime and everything. Yeah. It's not something you lose at night. Now, if I want to put a camera on this, I unscrew this. Like this. And I have this. Now, uh, got ahead of myself a little bit. I have a, a pointer too, just like Bruce talked about. And it works exactly the same way. You do everything the same way as Bruce said, you a, a red dot pointer. So, I'm the, I don't have to explain that. So this here is an adapter. Screws on like this. Slide my camera on like this. You've got live screen, live view. So you can see what you're gonna take. Now this is important in the day, if I'm out at night and I'm using this setup, I usually set it on, I was saying if, if I had the wide angle lens on, cam, on that camera, I'd put it at 64 ISO and, uh, you know, get it, set it up. And then what I use, set it on bulk. And then I use this, it's a remote control. I could snap it, I, I wait, count off 20 seconds, there's a counter on the screen, snap it again, and you don't get any camera shape. If you try to take a picture and then you push this manually, you've ruined it. So it's important to have a remote when you're using this kind of setup. I also like to carry an extra battery for the camera. And uh, well, basically, that's it, the setup. You, uh, I don't want to run it. I don't need to, but uh, you've got your clock drive. Basically, if it's if it's perfectly aligned, the only thing you have to worry about is uh, once in a while, if you haven't set it perfectly, you might have to bump it up a little bit. You might, you know, but if it's set up properly, if you polar aligned it, daytime you can't see Polaris, so. You got to have a compass, get it as close as you can, and then see if, see what you're you're looking at, and you can always move the mount manually, tiny fraction. Now, what this is really great for, and I use it the most, is for uh, solar viewing. When we have a so event where the club goes and we're showing people the sun. This is the setup I use. It tracks it perfectly. You can just walk away and leave it as long as the kids don't grab it and take it out of focus. You just leave it in focus. And I ask different members, I know Richard, different members, can you look after the scope for a while? And you, all you have to do is every once in a while, you have to bump it, maybe, and that's it. So that's the beauty of this type of clock drive. It's not a computer, but it's a lot cheaper than a computer mount. I put these motors on myself. I just got to send them over and uh, I put it on myself. It's, it's nothing to do. And uh, it tracks. So that's just basically, uh, that's it. <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, what would that tracker be for? Um, this, is about, this is about, uh, I think it's, I can't tell you, I, I think it's, about oh, 600 bucks now, maybe, you know, the, with the amount, but it, I bought it a couple of years ago. Like they were saying, last time I looked at a dog, it was about six to $800. Now he's saying it's over a thousand. So I haven't, I haven't had any reason to look. Sure. Yeah. But, um, and as this far, year. As far as your wife's concerned, everything costs yeah. $49. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'll tell you a little story. This scope here is beautiful. It's an apple. It's it's beautiful optics in that. I got that from one of the founding members when originally found the club. 
I got it for like a hundred bucks because he wanted someone that would use it to have it from Bill Iden. And Bill Iden was, uh, he donated money when we first started the club to help us. I can't remember how much it was. Eh? I don't know if it was a few thousand dollars or something. I think he actually wanted to us to keep that under our hat. Well, he's dead, so yeah, it doesn't matter. matter. <laughs> but when, and he's doing what, you know, when I get where I can't use my equipment, I'm probably going to try, if there's a young person in the club that's interested, I'd probably give it away. You know what I mean? If it, I'd rather it got used than not. Yeah. So that's where I got this from Bill Iden. And I, I always think of Bill when I uh, use it. And like I say, daytime, I have a push pull mount. And it's all it is, it's like the dog. It swivels and it goes up and down. I put this on in the daytime. You go down to Davis Bay, you can take pictures of whales, you know, anything. It's with the camera on like this because it's right side up and it's really nice. So you've got a real good. Well, if you're using that for solar, you must have a fairly good filter. No, I have a solar scope. But you have a solar I got a, okay. yeah, and so the Bill has one in that. Okay. Uh, there's a few members of the club and the club has one now and there are a few there you know I don't know probably about three thousand dollars but uh yeah I have a really nice. challenge here okay I want you to aim it at the clock oh just, tough okay. one okay. okay I'm gonna disengage here I'll take a picture of it if I can let's see here Let's see. I put this on. Uh, you took your red. Is the red dot still on there? So can you use that? No, I don't need it. I just want to. I don't want to set. But if you came about. Hey, I don't need uh, 64 ISO. Oh, I'm yeah. thinking about finding something on that temperature. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's so tricky. Yeah. I, I ISO. I think in here, ISO 400 is plenty. Okay, now. Let's see, I'm gonna, I'll put it on. Yeah, where is it? Where is it happening here? Anyway, the, what, the, the reason why I asked you to do that was just if it's an old azimuth mount, you just don't like uh, 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 uh. But when you're with a oh, I see uh, what I'm so it's you can see it's a little bit more awkward. It's, it's almost it's, simple. It, yeah, yeah. But also, this is not so bad because it's a refractor, so you're just basically looking through it. But if you have a uh, a, a an eyepiece coming up the side, then you you might find that the eyepiece is now going straight down. Oh yes, yeah, okay. Or it's facing the wrong way. Yeah, so I always see so long say that. Yeah. One of the points about a Newtonian, it really helps if you have the ability, like a chameleon, to look in the eyepiece with one eye and along the axis of the scope with the other. My wife can do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's a keep with the track and keep <laughs> she knows what I can do with it. And this it clicked on like uh, the yeah, other one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.